My name is Omar Isa, and here with me, Wojtek. We are from a security company based in Heidelberg, Germany. And today's talk will be about network automation and specifically autonomous networks. So what is it about? Haven't we all had that problem that we send a technician to the site and he doesn't have the running configuration for the router? Haven't we had this problem that while configuring something, we had a typo mistake that we kept troubleshooting for days and days? What if I said to you this is now from the past? What if I said to you that now there is a technology that will make you use your routers and switches as if you are using a USB? You just connect it and it starts working. This is it. You can build networks of hundreds and hundreds of nodes in just, in just a matter of minutes. Well, this will be the first part of today's presentation. I'll introduce to you a new technology that will ease your life. But this technology is introduced by Cisco. Everything is proprietary, and we cannot understand it, and we cannot see what's there in our network. And this will be for the second part of today's presentation. We will reverse engineer everything in the protocol, and we will understand everything. If you are interested in attacking, hacking, and crashing devices, the third part will be for you. We have multiple demos, we have multiple vulnerabilities, so we hope you enjoy it. <laughs> So everything started by IBM in 2001. So they had the idea that systems are getting more and more complex by time, and we need systems that can manage themselves. When we thought about it, or when IBM thought about it, it thought that we need systems that can configure themselves. You don't need to configure anything. They can optimize themselves, optimize the running resources. They can even secure themselves. We don't have any problems in that. Just the machine will do everything for you. Yeah, this sounds a little bit optimistic, but in 2013, Cisco and people from IETF decided to make this into reality, decided to implement something which we call autonomic network. What's the idea of autonomic network? It's just one device, one router, and anything that connects to this router after that will be configured automatically. You don't need to configure anything at all. But the question comes like, how many configuration commands do I need to write on this device? Do I need to write everything that will be on the other devices? No, it's just five commands. You just write five commands, and after that, everything connected to your device will be up and running. Okay, what if I have new device? How many commands do I need to write? None. You don't have to write anything at all. What if I have an old device that has a running configuration from before? then it's just one command. And after that, once you connect your device to this one device, which we call the register here, it will have a basic configuration. Yeah, I see this sounds a little bit optimistic, but let's see it live. So, Wojtek, if you can help me with that. We have here, we have here one new device for people who are aware of Cisco. This is like what you get once you buy a totally new device, and you just remove the whole configuration. What we'll be doing here that we will ask, I ask Wojtek here if he can connect it to the register and see how it will go. So we will just raise our hands, we won't configure anything, and we will just watch whether anything will happen or not. So as we see here, device started to be configured on its own. We see that some files or some configurations things are being transferred to it. We see like some and some interfaces start to become up, and we can see that there are some tunnel interface and other configuration things. So for this, yeah. Hello. So as we can see that we got like basic configuration. We will see what basic configuration we do. We mean about here. So first of all, we can see that. I'm getting some keys. I, I see here like now I'm getting like a 3072 bit key. I'm being I'm being uh, like having new interfaces that come up. But in order to see this live, we would just now try to type like show IPv6 interface brief. Autonomous networks run on IPv6. And as we can see here, we have like multiple interfaces which are up. We have like now an autonomic network interface. We have like uh, the loopback interface also will come up. So if you can run the command, please, again. 
Yeah. So we can see like the network interface came up, the configuration came up, we started to get some IP addresses, we started to get some information. So what happened here and what is the basic configuration we mean about or we speaking about once we connect this device and what we will get? That's what we will see throughout the presentation or the first part of the presentation. So if you can take me back for the slides. And so. Well, what are the implications of this? Now, once you connect your device to another device, you will get a basic configuration. You will get interfaces connected to you. You will get like tunnel interfaces which comes up for you. You will have an encrypted and secured connection between you and all the other devices within your network. What do you need to configure for that? None, totally none. You just need to write five commands on one single device, which we call the register. And after that, everything is configured for you. To understand what happened in the background and what is the communication flow that happened, we can see that Cisco started or wanted to divide the connection into three phases. Something we call channel discovery, adjacency discovery, and after that, secure channel. Well, what does that mean? Well, Cisco decided that for the first time, devices, devices need to see each other on the level two layer, on level two, oh yeah, on layer two level. So what they start to do is that the registers start to send probes, saying like, is there any autonomic device around? Can we get any configuration? Is there anything reachable? And once the device is, once the register finds a reachable device, it starts to the second phase. We call it here adjacency discovery. What happens in adjacency discovery, it's like, after that we go from layer two to layer four communication, and what happens here that the register, the register starts by saying, well, I support this domain name, I support this network, would you like to be part of my network? How do we define whether the device can be part of the network or not? We check, like, the whitelist. What's the whitelist that we have here? It's just the serial number of the devices, because we are speaking about totally new devices that first time like booted. So if you are rejected, then we will just be neighbors on level two. If you are accepted, then perfect. We will issue for you a certificate. This certificate will be as the ID for you for any further communication. We can use this certificate after that just to act as like uh, for any secure connection because we will have your private key or we will have your public key there. This is a UDP service that run on port 4936. To have a small diagram in order to understand what we are speaking about here, we can see it as the following. The register starts by saying, hey, this is the domain name that I support, this is the configuration that I can provide, this is the network name, and the in-release response saying, well, this is my domain name. If the domain name is empty, it means that this new in-release just would like to be part of your domain. What will you do after that? That you will check your whitelist. Is this device allowed to join my domain? And this is the security mechanism that Cisco chose in order to protect any malicious devices from connecting to your domain. So you are accepted, perfect. This is my domain certificate. This is my ID. Let's issue for you one too. Please generate the key. Once the key is generated here and sent back to the register, we will start by issuing a certificate we can understand the certificate as just an ID that you are part of this. Who will issue the certificate? It depends. Either the register itself, or if you have a like a dedicated certificate authority within your domain, it can do such a function. Finally, we have done the certificate, we send it back to you, and that's it. We are just speaking about somehow like five packets within this category, and you are done. After that, we build the secure channel we build some tunnel interfaces so we can communicate together. What are the available technologies to secure the tunnel? Well, we already have the IPsec, but in Cisco's perspective, or from autonomic perspective, this is a backward compatibility, this is a backward technology. Cisco introduced something new, which we call Dyke, and Dyke is, for the data internet key exchange, it's based on Ike v2. It has the same characteristics as IPsec, but it's only the second phase. So it's much, much, much less overhead. We are speaking about port 5000, and it's always the one preferred over IPsec. 
the idea of autonomic networks that people are the problems so in order to avoid such a thing everything is automated for you you cannot change this you cannot even change the order you cannot even favor like ipsec over dike there is no even a command for you to configure dike on cisco routers so what's the configuration of the register then we said like we need to implement five commands and everything will be working after that okay we said that from adjacency discovery, we need to have like a domain name, what's my network name, and this is the first thing that you write by like domain ID and you write your domain name. You have like an optional command to define a whitelist. If you don't define a whitelist, everything connected to you will be accepted within your network. We can have like after once you get like the certificate or once you get the key, who will issue the certificate and you, this is by like defining which type of CA you will use. If you have a dedicated one, you would just write its IP address if it's a local one, so you say like CA local. Local means that the register will be the one who issues the certificate for you. And finally, you just start the services by writing autonomic. This is all, no much hassle, nothing to write, nothing to do. What's for the other devices? If it's a brand new one, none. If it's just a router with a previous configuration that you had a configuration from before, just one command, autonomic, start the autonomic services. So we are speaking about basic configuration. What do we mean by that? Well, what will happen that you will get like three to four interfaces configured with IPv6 address for you. This IPv6 address is based on your domain name. You will get like, you will start generating a key. A VRF will be created on your machine and the AAA will be allowed if you have a syslog, a TFTP server within your network, it will be it will be like found automatically. You don't need to configure anything here. You just say like you have a TFTP, put it within something called MDNS. This is a protocol within autonomic network, and this server will be like found automatically, discovered automatically. You don't need to write anything. Everything will be now like your like radius server. If you have a radius server now, you can only access your device in a secure manner. So this sounds good and if you need to have like further configuration if you would like to uh, put like an access list or something else you can put this configuration of the tftp server and the machine will just grab it automatically we are not speaking about technology from the future we are speaking about technology that has been into the market at least for three to four years and the question comes here after that are you really in control now you understand the technology now you have a rough idea how it works. But are you really in control? Do you really know what's running inside your network? Well, I wanted to see how it looked like the, this packets of autonomic network under Wireshark. And that's what I have seen. An LLC packets. For the people who are not aware of LLC, LLC is a layer two technology. Honestly, I didn't expect to see something like that. At least I expected to see like UDB service. I expected to see Dyke or IPsec, whatever it is. But I expected to see something more than just layer two. And here comes the technology. What's really running within our network? And to know something like this, we will reverse engineer it together. This is the first frame that we see once we start the Wireshark. This is how it looks like. The question how is how we start, how we start reverse engineering this. And the first idea comes that, well, we always start by an Ethernet frame. But which one of the Ethernet frames that we can start with? We have like three types of Ethernet frames. And by checking those bytes, we understand that this is a not, a, not an Ether2 net frame. And by checking this, we understand this is a snap frame. So at least we understand the first few bytes within this frame. This is like a snap frame identifier or a snap header. So in order to understand this, we start by the following. This is the destination MAC and source MAC. We have the length. And um, here we can see the snap frame identifier. We can have the organization unique identifier. And finally, like uh, autonomic protocol ID identifier. The question comes after this, how we proceed. This is a proprietary protocol. Cisco said how the technology works, but it didn't say how it, what's the content, what's the significance of the packets. 
after reverse engineering for some time and after tests for some time, we believe that protocol is based on this header. Well, <clears throat> this is the header that Cisco used to, or we can use to analyze the protocol. It has some fixed parts, and after that, some TLVs. For the people who are aware of TLV principle, it's the idea that you define a type, a length, a variable type, a variable length, and then you put the value of it. We will see it out throughout the presentation here. So the version of this, where if we are speaking about the channel discovery, the first thing that we start with is version one and some reserved bytes. And after that, we start with the state. State means which part or which phase are we in within the protocol? Well, this is O1, this is the very basic beginning, so it's O1 here. After that, we have some factory default bytes, and after that, we can have uh, the opcodes. What's the opcodes? The opcodes means what's the significance of what we are seeing. What does this frame, what's the value or what's the importance of this frame? And for the available opcodes, here are they. So. One is if it's the first announcement, after that for the reply, and even if it's like, just keep alive. If you would like to continue analyzing, we can see that what comes next is this factory, like uh, some factory default, this is the header length I see here, and after that some reserved bytes, and type and length and value. So you start by identifying some specific types, put a length and put whatever value it takes. For the available TLVs, for this, we can see that for the only channel discovery, that's what we have. What we are trying now to do is trying to understand the significance of what passes within our network, at least to make sure that we have control on what we see. After that comes the adjacency discovery. Well, this is the frame of adjacency discovery. It's quite big. We suspect there's a UDP here, but why Wireshark cannot analyze this? This is because there is an additional header that Cisco decided to add. We call it layer 2.5, which is the autonomic layer. We will see it out. So same idea, we have just a snap frame in the beginning, and after that, we have this. This is a customized channel discovery header. This is what stops Wireshark from analyzing and understanding the packets. What's the difference between this and the last stage? Um, can we do anything with the slides? Can you just like, go, like, go from full screen mode? Just make sure. Yeah, something like this. Or I'll make it bigger. So people can see. OK, just put full screen mode. Full screen mode. F5. F5. Yeah, now the, the slides are better. So what's the difference between this and what we used to have? Well, we can see that the state here is 05, not 01 as it used to be. It means that there is, this is an adjacency, adjacency discovery frame, and there's an ether type. Ether type that says what comes next is an IPv6. So at least we start now to understand why Wireshark cannot analyze this. What comes next, as we said, IPv6 header, and from the IPv6 header, we understand that comes after it is UDP. And the question comes after this, how we can analyze that? Okay, it's the same header, same frame, but different types, different values, different opcodes. The version here is two, not one, like the one we used to have. And the state here is O2, because now we started the booting phase, the idea of getting certificate and stuff like that. For the adjacency discovery, we have like three opcodes or three states. One for the just booting up, whether you are like accepted or rejected within the access list or within the whitelist. And finally, if we would like to build a secure channel. After that, there are some reserved bytes and the opcodes. As we said, opcodes, what is the significance and importance of this byte that we see or of this packet that we see? Here are the available opcodes. It's a little bit bigger here. And come after that, just the header length, same idea, and some factory default reserved bytes, and type length and value, same idea. So for the available types, they are quite big. It would have taken like three, four slides just to put them here, but you get the idea. And now, starts at the fun part. We have a secure channel. 
what if we are interested to know what's really being sent inside the secure channel? Well, this is what's sent. This is an encrypted thing. How do we know that it's Dyke? Well, just from the port, it's 5000. But what is this packet? We don't have any idea about. How we get information about being, what's being sent really inside? Well, who can solve this problem is this device. How is that? Well, this is one of the first devices that supports autonomic network. We, it started supporting autonomic networks since 2014. But how it can, it, how it can help? OK, it comes with the question is, if we have an IPsec, it means maybe it like wasn't supported from the beginning. Maybe there are like IPsec is backwards compatibility. OK, how IPsec can even help? Because Cisco is a closed box device. You don't have access to anything. But from the RFC, you have IPsec null. IPsec null is the idea that you don't need to configure any encryption. You just configure like integrity uh, on the packets just to check it's correct. So you don't have any problems. Now you can send each and everything in just plain text, and you can see everything. And well, this is one packet that can only be encrypted, can only be seen inside the tunnel. It's the RPL. And this is the routing protocol of the autonomic network. And we can see here, this is the ESP. And this is exactly like from the inside the tunnel. The question comes after that, is it secure? We now have a little bit of idea what the technology is. We understand what's being sent and significance of each and every byte. But is it secure? For this, we will have a live chat with a guy from the support who is responsible for this if we have any problems while we are trying just to check our devices. So the first idea that we had is, well, as we understand from autonomic network, everyone has their own domain. So if there are two domains, they never could connect with each other. This shouldn't be under any circumstances. OK, let's try to put this into practice. So Wojtek, if you can just go to one of the old devices that we have. Yeah, this device is called different domain. It's just from a domain different than what we have. We can know something like that by writing show autonomic device. And we can see here that the domain name is called, or domain ID is called different. And what I will do here is that I will connect it to this register, which is from a domain called ERNW. So please connect it to it. Well, I expect that they would be just neighbors on layer two level, but nothing more. No certificates, no configuration, no tunnel interface, nothing. And that's what the documents say. OK, let's see. I see. Oh, OK. I see lots of configuration. I see that the certificates are being valid, which shouldn't be. Shouldn't be at all as per the docs of Cisco. But could you just run like show autonomic control plane to see whether they built really the tunnel? OK, I can see that the tunnel here has been built. Hmm. Well, this shouldn't be. Shouldn't be at all from Cisco's perspective. So let's go back to the support, please. Well, we connected two nodes from two different domains, and they worked. They connected together. They shouldn't be. Uh, Cisco has been very responsive to us. In some of the vulnerabilities that we have reported here, you'll see that Cisco responded quite quickly, honestly. And there are some times that not that fast, but we would see. So the first thing that the business unit said that they would check with the, uh, like we would check with the business unit, the people who wrote the documents, if that can be allowed. And what they came back to us with that, well, if they are connected from two different domains, but we have the same CA signed both certificates, then they can communicate. But this is against the documents, you know. This is, shouldn't be because they are two different domains. How that can be? Okay, this is a feature that we will add it in the future. Okay. 
okay, not a big deal. I, I understand the problem. Maybe it's not that very important. But you know what? Even if it connects to mine, I'll just revoke it. It's not a big deal for me. So if you can just please go to the register. And we will just try to revoke the certificate. And the command for revoking the certificate is um, crypto PKI AN uh, PKI server ANRA-CS and we write revoke. So, and after that, we just type the serial number of the device or the serial number of the certificate. Well, it shouldn't be a big deal. It won't cause us any problem. We just won't revoke it here, but once we test it, it didn't work. So we return back to the support saying, uh, yeah, we return back to the support saying, well, we tried to revoke the certificate, but it didn't work. They said, did you try it like on local or an external? We said, well, we tried it on both. If it's local, they said, well, we didn't implement it here. I said, no problem. We tried it on external too. They said, okay, then this is a CVE then. So, yeah, we understand from Cisco perspective that certificate revocation is not implemented. In other way, there is no way, no way for you to throw any malicious or compromised node from your network. Once any of your nodes has been compromised, it's game over. He will always be there, except if you have the courage to destroy the whole network, issue new certificates for everyone, and then build the network. No whitelist can stop anything for that, because if you have a certificate, you are not checked by the whitelist. You just pass. You are a VIP. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe it's a problem, but you know what? I have full control over my network. No one can touch my network. No one can touch my devices. Everything is safe somehow. So I'll just go to the register again and write something like show autonomic control plane details. And as we can see, the communication has been up here, I, I think, like three, four minutes. So the idea that nothing can affect my communication and nothing can, you know, attack me. And it's not a big problem that the node is just, you know, some nodes are, will be compromised. No. I see Voiting is typing something here. He's resetting my channel. <laughs> it's not that simple, man. Come on. And what you are doing. And if you can show the people what you are doing, please. Yeah, just take it a little bit. Uh, so, what? You registered my communication? Everything went down? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, this shouldn't be at all. <laughs> like, an attacker cannot do a simple thing like that. And even he's writing to me, like, check your Wireshark. Let me see what's there in Wireshark. You don't care? Yeah. So. Just check it. Mm -hmm. Okay, just, okay. The idea here that even if you check Wireshark, it looks like there's a problem here with the packet sniffer, that even the RPL packets, which should be sent totally in encrypted format, they are just sent in plain text. So somehow, if you manage to reset the configuration, reset the channel, not only you break the communication itself, Everything which is encrypted is flushed in plain text. You can see the whole configuration, the whole everything running inside. The RPL, your routing information, everything. So please, if you can take me back to the slides. So once we said that to Cisco, we got a new CVE here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what's the implications of this? Anyone can reset your connection. Anyone can attack you. And once they reset the connection, they even know what confidential things you are sending within the, your secure channel. Uh, this is a little bit scary because anyone can make a denial of service on me. But at least my devices are up. My devices are strong enough that they are working fine. Correct? OK. I see Wojtek here is showing me a video. And what he's doing is, I see he's trying to reset it. Yeah, man, I understand my communication is not that strong. I understand that you can reset it. But 
you are doing ping? Are you implying that my device will go down? <laughs> it's not that simple. Not by, I mean, not by resetting the communication or resa resetting the channel multiple times. The node will crash. The node will go down. <clears throat> I don't think so, honestly. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you see, you are still pinging. Everything is up. Everything is working. Come on, you cannot challenge me in front of them. No, uh, my my presentation. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just waiting, just for your sake, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, still second iteration. You see, you are pinging, everything is up, everything is fine. There's nothing to worry about here. Uh, uh, you know. Okay. <laughs> This not crashed. <laughs> this shouldn't be. Shouldn't be at all. Now you not just reset my communication. Not just you take the like the channel down. You even take the device itself down. Take me back to the support. <laughs> uh, just if someone keep resetting the communication, then it eventually crashes. And for that, we have a new CVE. <laughs> yeah, what's the implications of this? Anyone can crash your devices. This attack takes um, somehow about 15 minutes. That's why we just have a video here. Okay, this is a little bit scary, so you crash my devices. But you know what? My register. The controlling point of the network, the strongest point in network. Show them how long it has been up. Show them, like show version include up. Yes, it has been up for 42 minutes. Nothing can attack it, nothing can do anything to it. Yeah, res crashing my register. No, it's not like the. <clears throat> Even my register crashed. <laughs> um, like that, I don't have anything in the network remaining. Like, the device itself can be crashed. The register itself can be crashed. So there is no network at all. J just take me to the support. Man. <laughs> and for that, we have a new CVE here. <laughs> What's the implications of this? The controlling point, the main point within the network can be easily crashed if you send like null or space byte within the network as the inroading name. Okay, then I have no other option. Sorry, I'll just disable autonomous network and I'll just run my IPv6 normally happily without any problems. So please wait. Yeah. Yeah, this is a different domain. This is the old device that I have. Just go like into configuration mode and just write no autonomic, and that's how we disable it. And if we would just give it a simple IPv6 address by writing interface gig zero over zero over zero, and we will give it like 2001 slash two here, so slash 64. And even I will also go to my new device. So if you can go to the new device, also wait, please. Just go to the new device. So it looks like Wojtek well, cannot connect to the first device. I don't know. It looks like it crashed on its own when it sees like other device crashed. It just happens. So at least now, you know what? I'm safe, literally safe. Please write it to us, safe. And even yes, with yeah, exclamation mark. Nothing can touch my devices. Nothing can do for me any harm or any problems. <clears throat> we didn't configure anything. 
It's just an IPv6 address. We disabled everything even. Yeah, take me back to the presentation. This is what I love to call the death kiss. Regardless, you have an IP or you have autonomic services or not, you are vulnerable. Just the idea that your, sub, your operating system supports autonomic network makes you vulnerable. Just knowing your IPv6 address will crash your network, even if you don't run the technology, even if you disable everything. What's the implications of this? Just one packet can crash everything you have. How to stop it? Just put an access list over each and every interface that you have to block ports 4936 and 48. If you have, for any reason, running autonomic network on your network or in your system, just upgrade your system. To conclude today's presentation, we have spoken about the autonomic network. We have analyzed its three phases. And after that, we had uh, spoken about the reverse engineering of each and everything. And after that, we introduced five new vulnerabilities. One of them can crash just the devices by knowing their IPv6 address. You don't need to know anything more. Finally, if you would like to get your hand dirty, start working on Autonomic Network. WireEdit is the first uh, application to use our analysis into this. And um, you can just also, if you don't have Cisco gear, you can download their image, which is called CSR1000V, and start working on that. I wouldn't have done it without the help and assistance of Mark Hoiser, who helped me so much with the protocol analysis. And finally, if you would like to have more information about network or autonomic network, I have written like three blog posts on insinuator.net. Well, in the end, thank you, Wojtek, for attacking everything that I have. And thank you for attention. And that's all.